Okay. I think we're uh, we're all set. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ben, if you want to turn your, your video on and uh, we're going to kick this off. So, good morning and, and welcome to our sixth virtual Lupus Health Conference of 2023, presented by uh, the Lupus Foundation in Northern California. My name is Tom Bakewell and I'm the Executive Director of LFNC. We're excited to welcome each of you uh, back to our free Lupus Health Conferences. We've, we've got a very exciting conference planned for you today. Uh, we'd also like to thank AstraZeneca and GSK for being the sponsors of today's conference. We're planning one more conference this year, a Spanish language conference on December 2nd. So if you or someone you know speaks Spanish, please check out our website or social media to find more information about this conference. We've got some really good content and speakers scheduled. As always, we wanna hear your thoughts on this conference. So be sure to complete the survey when the webinar ends. This is really the only way we can hear what you liked and any suggestions of what you'd like to see in the future. So thank you for that. Today uh, is a new program for us. We're introducing one that one of our board members has sponsored, and uh, we are going to be featuring two pharmacists who are going to discuss lupus medications current and future, and then we'll open it up to, to, uh, to questions. So I'm excited to introduce to you today our speakers, uh, Dr. Benjamin Hinton and Dr. Osa Idugan. Dr. Hinton is a uh, C senior market analyst, uh, access analyst, pardon me, and community pharmacist. He graduated from the Hampton University School of Pharmacy. And Benjamin has a pa uh, passion for making an impact on the community at large. Ever since his tenure at HU, he's been actively involved with improving patient access and being a health advocate, particularly in under underserved communities. He aims to increase diversity in pharma with a focus on patient care, healthcare innovation, and uh, new, creating new value through integrated data sets. Dr. Edegun is a clinical pharmacist and a graduate of the University of Washington School of Pharmacy. Osa developed his passion for working with patient populations with more rare and chronic diseases, such as cancer, HIV, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, arthritis, and solid organ transplant during his three years of work in specialty pharmacy. Understanding and helping patients navigate complex medical conditions, drug regimens, side effects, and drug interactions has been a foundational part of his professional practice as a pharmacist. His leadership and professional experience focus on patient care and technology innovations that enhance the, the patient pharmacy experience. Before we begin, please remember you can type in, in any question you may have into the Q&A section at any time during the presentation. We will ask all of the questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Now, please welcome Dr. Hinton and Dr. Edegan. All yours, guys. All right, all right. How's everybody doing today? Um, happy to be here and definitely excited to get this thing started and kicked off. Um, my name is Benjamin Lackey, uh, Mr. Tom said. Um, yeah, also, you can introduce yourself as well. Okay. Hopefully, you can all see my screen. All right. Yes, we can. All right. All right, I am back. My apologies, technical glitches with uh, everything. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome, perfect. Man, did you want me to control the slides? Uh, I will. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. So, hello, everyone. My name, is, again, is Osa, uh, one of the clinical pharmacists here. 
uh, just a quick uh, agenda items for today. We will be going over, we already went over the introductions. We're gonna go over what is lupus, how lupus is treated, available therapies, as well as therapies coming to the market soon. Uh, we're gonna break out into a quick uh, group question and answer session. And then after that, we'll go over some elephancy resources and events. So just quickly, we wanna make sure that we do protect patient privacy. So any protected health information that's shared within the presentation with the pharmacist will be protected by the pharmacist as directed in the HIPAA privacy laws. Any information shared during the Q&A session of the presentation will be at the discretion and disclosure of the participant. Further disclaimers, uh, the views and findings expressed in this document, um, presentation and related activities are those of the authors, that's me and Ben, um, and do not imply, endorse, or reflect any views of the Lupus Foundation of Northern California or the affiliates of the organizations or entity members, sponsors who contributed to the work. Uh, individuals have served in their individual capacity and uh, currently have no conflicts of interest. Uh, the information presented herein has been organized to provide the participants with as much information as possible that's important and integral um, in the time allotted. And this is not a complete list of side effects and warnings for any unexpected effects while taking these medications. Please contact your doctor or pharmacist. The materials contained within this presentation does not substitute for appropriate medication counseling. All right. Um... Thank you, Osa. Uh, my name is Benjamin Hinton. Like Tom also said, um, I'm very passionate about patient care. Um, I work in market access, so helping patients get access to the medications uh, from a broader view. I also work at CVS as a, a, a retail pharmacist, so I love to interact with patients. I love to talk to them and um, really just share and educate. Um, my passion is really about being an advocate um, and really just sharing as much information as possible so that as a patient, you can be empowered to um feel comfortable talking to your physician, feel comfortable talking about your symptoms and, and the different challenges that you may have um, so that we can overcome them and have better um, patient outcomes. So it's just a little bit about me. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. And uh, again, my name is Osa, last name is Adogun. I'm a clinical pharmacist, uh, currently working with a specialty pharmacist. Uh, I developed my passion working with various rare disease states in my uh, undergraduate experience, as well as graduate experience in pharmacy school. Um, as well as my current practice. And uh, really glad to be here. I'm really glad to be able to provide value to this community and this patient population. All right, so we're gonna go over the types of lupus, a brief overview of the medical definition, as well as the signs and symptoms. We will then go into the prevalence of lupus and the incidence, as well as the global prevalence and incidence as well. All right. So the different types of lupus. Um, so first is um, the systemic lupus, erythematosus, and that's the most common term or the most common form of it. Uh, and we also have cutaneous. And so it's limited to the skin, but it can also cause many types of different rashes or lesions. And they may show up as like red spots, um, inflamed. Um, they may hurt as well. Um, there's also drug-induced lup lupus, which comes into um into effect whenever you take specific drugs like hydroxy um, that may um, incur a uh, lupus response. Um, and then we also have neonatal lupus and that's pretty rare, um, but it affects newborns you know, right after birth. Um, there's also different man manifestations of lupus. So it can show up in you know, a variety of different ways. We have we only have three here, you know, lupus nephritis, lupus arthritis, and lupus pneumonitis. And that's when the inner linings of the lungs are inflamed. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in further slides. But um, just real quickly, there are, you know, they have, you might experience it in your, your heart as well, like uh, inflamed um, inflamed walls of the heart. Um, there's also, you know, you might have inflammation in the brain as well. So there's just a variety of different ways that uh, lupus can show up and present itself in the body. All right. All right. So SLE, like Ben said, is a systemic lupus erythematosus. It's a chronic multi-system autoimmune disease that results in inflammation and tissue damage. SLE can affect many different parts of the body, and this can include your skin, your joints, kidneys, immune system, liver, lungs, and nervous system. So it can attack various different parts of the body. 
Earlier diagnosis and better management have resulted in a lower prevalence of potentially life-threatening disease. And lupus can affect many different organs in the body. So the clinical presentation of lupus is going to look different for each individual person. So how lupus may be in one patient may not equate to how it's going to present and show up in another patient. Lupus symptoms also sometimes come and go. These are called disease flares. And remissions also do occur. So these are where your symptoms actually improve for a long period of time and you start to feel better. So all of these are potential manifestations and ways that the disease can behave. All right. Uh, so next we're going to talk a little bit about some of the signs and symptoms of lupus, uh, a systemic lupus. So one could be prolonged or extreme fatigue. You might have a fever um, over several days. Possibly have like swollen knees and joints, weight changes, rashes, most commonly or uh, well, most um, recognizable of uh, the butterfly rash. Um, the chest or abdominal, abdominal pain, difficulty breathing, short breath, muscle pain, weakness. I'd experience some hair loss as a result of, you know, the hair follicle being inflamed, um, sun or light sensitivity, might have kidney problems or issues or mouth sores. Um, or like, so basically in the inner, in the inner lining of the mouth, you might get some inflammation there. Um, you also may experience a little bit of memory or, or focusing issues or some eye problems as well. So like Osa alluded to earlier, it can show up in a variety of different ways. And um, the most important thing, or one of the most important things to do is, is track the how you feel. So um, when you have a patient journey, or when you have your own personal journey or your personal journal, to talk about some of these, this is a, a great way to be able to have those initial conversations with your physician, right? Because, you know, when you get into the office, you may not remember everything that you've experienced. You may not remember, you know, the exact day that it started or the exact day that it happened, but having a journal with you that can kind of write down, okay, I'm feeling this day, I'm feeling really tired today, it can kind of help to paint a better picture of how um, you are feeling and honestly help the doctor to better move the process along when it comes to being diagnosed, when it comes to learning more, when it comes to um, having better treatment options for you. So the more information that you're able to provide to your physician or your health, your primary health care provider, um, the the more aligned and more um, calibrated we can get to a treatment regimen and also, you know, to a diagnosis. So I just wanted to shed a little bit of light on there. Um, okay, you can go to the next slide. All right, so now we're going to talk about the global prevalence of lupus. This is a world map kind of showing the new diagnoses of lupus per 100,000 people. As you can see, it goes over North and South America, as well as uh, Russia, uh, China, as well as Europe, as well as Australia in addition. So there is a global prevalence. Africa, as well as the Middle East, tend to not have um, these diagnoses or tend to have a lot less of them. Uh, but that could be due to underreporting and underdiagnosing, and we'll discuss that in further slides as well. All right. So, what is the prevalence in the U.S.? Um, so, from what is reported, it's between forty to one hundred and fifty cases per one hundred thousand people um, within the U.S. population. Uh, as far as race um, distribution, it tends to occur more frequently in minority um, and ethnic groups, including African Americans, Asian populations, Hispanic patients, compared to white patients. Um, lupus nephritis also occurs more often in African-American and Hispanic patients than white patients also. Um, and as far as the, the distribution of men and women, um, it occurs in almost 10 times as many white women than, uh, than white men. And it, it is um, more likely seen in, in women in general. Um, it's, it occurs in five times as many African-American women as African-American men. And men with SLE are more likely than women to develop lupus nephritis. So that is one distribution, but um, it is worth, it is more, um, it occurs more in women within childbearing age. So between like four, 15 and 45, that's the most, um, the most commonly um, seen occurrences uh, within that population. It can also present in people that are over 50 years old, old as well. So the one thing about this disease and why it's so you know complicated and why it's so hard to diagnose and treat is that because as you can see it it shows up in so many different variety of, of age ranges and even when it shows up in kids that are you know below the age of 15 what we see is that it's usually more um heightened and more volatile in terms of its symptoms and how it reacts it's more um it's more apparent you know like even when dealing with the claims and seeing that um, the prescribing of these medications that are for lupus 
they see they're prescribed at higher doses for kids, even though it's being used off label, but they're seeing how it's, you know, they're, the doses are higher because of the fact that it's sometimes more apparent um, in kids. Right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so let's talk about some lupus lifestyle and management interventions. So non-pharmacologic interventions that you can make. So one of the most important ones is actually diet. So keeping a well-balanced diet that's low in fat, high in fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, as well as keeping a moderate amount of meat, poultry, and fish is also recommended. Depending on your blood pressure uh, or the presence of edema, which is kind of like the water swelling in your extremities, Choosing foods with less salt or sodium could also be recommended by your providers. Some studies show that consuming a good amount of fiber can also affect how your microbiome, your gut bacteria manage certain lupus symptoms. In addition, sun protection is also very important. Uh, UV light can worsen some lupus symptoms related to your skin. So we strongly recommend wearing sunscreen with at least SPF 30 or higher every single day. If you do have skin sensitivity or rashes that occur with your version of lupus, um, avoiding direct sun exposure when possible is recommended. Keeping up to date with your vaccinations is also very important. Certain drug treatments for lupus may require you to avoid vaccines that contain live viruses. This includes your MMR, your varicella, your polio vaccines. So always check with your providers if and when you are due for vaccinations and if they are appropriate for you during that time. Another one that isn't um, as common is keeping a treatment journal. This is a very strong tip for um, new, especially new lupus patients, is to keep a track of your medications, your doses that you're taking, and any side effects that you may be experiencing. This may be important because, especially as the disease sometimes comes and wanes, you want to know exactly what symptoms you experienced when you last took that specific medication or how long the symptoms lasted so that when your disease does potentially flare back up, you do have a certain expectation of how it may react in the future. So keeping a treatment journal is another very important strategy. Exercise. So exercising regularly can be a challenge for some lupus patients, especially with lupus patients that have fatigue or difficulty breathing. Uh, but it is beneficial to keep active as often as you can to continue to feel well. Rest is also very important to make sure that you're aware of how your body is feeling. Some patients, especially patients who have inflamed joints, uh, low impact exercises can be beneficial to prevent further ag aggravation of those joint damage that the condition is causing. So some of these exercises could be walking, swimming, stretching, or yoga, using exercise equipment if available. Another additional tip is to avoid uh, smoking as well as limiting alcohol, alcohol, alcoholic beverages in moderation. Uh, so we recommend one maximum of one drink per day for women or two drinks per day for men is usually safe, but always consult with your provider about what is best for you and based on your lab values. Monitoring your weight is another very important uh, tip for lupus treatments. The steroids such as prednisone used to treat lupus symptoms can potentially cause weight gain um, and different potential symptoms of lupus can decrease your appetite or your ability to eat food, which can lead to weight loss. So let your doctor know if you have any significant changes in weight. This could be anything as big as five pounds in a week that, it, that you definitely should be monitoring with your provider. And then obviously maintaining regular visits with your primary care provider. So make sure you do your annual physicals, monitor your routine labs, and make sure to keep all your appointments as much as possible. All right, thank you, Osa. Uh, so in terms of how is lupus treated, so I'm going to touch on a few here. Uh, we have a few lined up, um, a few more slides following. But for starters, as far as what's available, um, we the first thing that is usually typically prescribed when you are finally diagnosed with lupus uh, is immunosuppressants. Um, it could come in the form of hydroxychloroquine, um, but there's also other immunosuppressants that are prescribed as well. And immunosuppressant is a medication that suppresses your immune system, exactly what it says. So it kind of lowers your body's um, rate of how it wants to respond to an antigen, respond to uh, a foreign a foreign um, entity in the body. Um, and the unique case with lupus is that it attacks itself. And so that is what's kind of driving that that response. And so what immunosuppressants do is kind of want to calm the, the immune response down Right. Um, and so a few examples of this is methotrexate. We have the flutamide, the um, drugs called uh, 
cyclophosphamide, cyclosporin, chacrolimus, um, azathioprine, um, belimumab, which is belista, and rituximab. Um, and the main, once again, the main thing with this or the main um, the main endpoint with these are to improve long-term patient outcomes. So the management should aim at the remission of disease symptoms and signs um, and prevention of damage of cruel and minimal um, drug side effects. So like Osta said as well, uh, with your treatment journal, even like your patient journal, be making sure that you write down, you know, any side effects that you may have, that you may run into or, you know, how you feel a certain day that can help to kind of triangulate which medication might be better for you um, moving forward. And so the complete remission is when, you know, without having to take any drugs, like you're, you're, um, you're finally fine. Like you don't feel any, any symptoms and that is infrequent. So for the most part, um, patients that are diagnosed with lupus up to this point um, do have to, you know, take certain drugs in order to continue to have the remission of those symptoms. Um, they do have different ways and different uh, metrics to kind of judge where the disease severity is. Um, but that is, once again, something that um, you have to talk with your doctor about. Um, and the one thing that I will say also with these medications is that it's, it's hard to um, understand that the the first sometimes the first line drugs may not work right so a sizable portion almost like forty percent of patients may not respond um, after you know to the first line treatment so they might not respond to the first medication that you have um, that you are prescribed and so when that does happen uh, we just have to continue to you know talk to your doctor talk to your pharmacist as well to try to triangulate um a better medication and then you know it, it is in the case with some other drugs they may take a little bit longer to see an impact so. That's one thing you have to have to be aware of. Some medications may take, you know, a few days. Some may take like a, a few months in order to um, see a little bit more of the efficacy in those products. All right, you can go to the next one, boss. All right. So how is lupus treated? So this is a general treatment approach. These are from the 2019 update of the EU recommendations for the manage of SLE. So treatment in SLE aims at remission or low disease activity and prevention of flares. So many patients with SLE will require one or more immunosuppressants or cytotoxic agents to help to control the disease. Mild lupus are patients that have predominantly skin and joint involvement and may also feel increasingly fatigued. Moderate lupus patients may be described as patients that have uh, significant but not organ-threatening disease. Severe lupus, on the other hand, can be categorized as patients with organ threatening manifestations such as renal, so your kidneys, or brain involvement of their lupus. And they generally need more stronger immunosuppressive drugs for the treatment. Patients with mild disease may do well on a short-term use of an NSAID or a glucocorticoid such as prednisone. Hydroxychloroquine, which is HCQ on the uh, slide, is going to be uh, recommended in all patients with lupus and in all severities. It's a mainstay of therapy due to its anti-inflammatory effect as well as its disease-modifying effects. Glucocorticoids such as prednisone uh, can provide rapid symptom relief, but the medium and long-term aim should be to minimize the daily dose of glucocorticoids or steroids to less than 7.5 milligrams a day, prednisone equivalent, or to discontinue them, discontinue them totally. So this is because of the fact that long-term steroid therapy can actually have uh, detrimental effects, including irreversible organ damage, which is uh, what we don't want when a disease is already targeting the organs in the first place. So we wanna keep the glucocorticoid uh, therapy to a minimum. We wanna do it for a short course and then potentially taper you off over time. So the treatment approaches emphasize using a combination of drugs to minimize chronic exposure to steroids and their harmful effects. So when we have tapered you off of the steroids, we're going to potentially add an immunosuppressive drug to also keep that same action, but not be damaging the organs. And this can include drugs such as methotrexate, azathioprine, or mycophenolate um, to dampen the immune system and to use less steroids for a shorter duration. Mycophenolate, uh, this is MTX uh, in the slide, uh, is going to be, oh, sorry, that's methotrexate. Uh, mycophenolate is NMF. Uh, mycophenolate is a potent immunosuppressive drug with efficacy in both renal and non-renal manifestations of lupus. So in patients with active or flaring lupus nephritis, uh, where the disease is actually targeting the kidneys, we also add on potential therapy with belimumab, which uh, should definitely be considered 
Uh, this is a more newer agent that we will talk about in future slides. And we will go over those therapies in the upcoming slides as well. Um, can you go to the next slide? All right, so now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper. So um, we, I referenced a few of the medications that are used to treat, uh, treat lupus, and now we're gonna go into like the ones that are used to treat mild to moderate. So like I said before, they initially are gonna, usually most times they're gonna start off on hydroxychloroquine. Um, and some of the side effects that you wanna work on, or not necessarily work on, but be aware of is um, some nausea, diarrhea, and mostly the, so there's, Issues with sometimes like your vision. And so is when you're taking this medication, uh, it's important to get your eyes checked every six to 12 months. Um, so at least at least once a year, um, because it can cause um, some some retinal damage. However, this is one of the medications that is a go to because they've seen more um, efficacy and treatment with this one. Um, so this is going to be like usually going to be like your starting agent. Um, typically, this is what's seen in practice. Um, so now, some of the contraindications or, or big warnings for this one is like St. John's syndrome, which is um, it's a rash that usually starts on the upper body, and then it, it'll quickly you know spread to other areas of your body. Um, there's also um, toxic epidermal necrolysis, and so that's when some of your um, your tissues start to 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 die, um, and then um, and that, but it's also like a it's not necessarily something that happens to, you know, majority of people, but it's something that, you know, is one thing to be aware about. Um, also, have other side effects such as like cardiac, skin, blood, blood sugar changes, um, any renal injuries, you know, neuropathy, um, any changes, any um, suicidal behavior. Um, those are something to definitely um, be aware about. And um, also, but once again, like just the vision changes. So just be aware of that. Um, the next class we're going to talk about is the NSAIDs. And so these are like your common drugs, like your ibuprofen, uh, your Motrin. And for this one, some of the side effects may include like a, uh, increased blood pressure or, you know, gastric ulcers, but that's more so with prolonged use. So like in your stomach, you might have, um, some internal, uh, some internal bleeding with the ulcers. Um, so that's once again, like with prolonged use. Um, then some contraindications for that is if you're on any blood pressure medications, um, called ACE and ARB inhibitors. So basically like um, they're like your lethartans or lisinopril's. Those are medications that are contraindicated with ibuprofen because they would both um, have an effect on the kidneys. As well as if you are pregnant, um, that is another um, contraindication for, for taking any NSAIDs such as like your, your Motrin or your ibuprofen or your Advil. And the next is, is aspirin. Um, and because it's in the same kind of cousin as, as ibuprofen, they're in the same class. Um, those can also cause gastric ulcers with prolonged use. So definitely just have to be mindful of how often you take those medications. Um, and once again, that's also contraindicated in pregnancy. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is an immunosuppressant drug called methotrexate. So with this one is some of the side effects may include like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, uh, mouth ulcers. Once again, because it's immunosuppressant, um, and just be, the one thing that I want to touch on with immunosuppressants is that uh, if you end up having a fever, and or you do have um, you come down with um, your what your white blood cell counts are, are are raised, then that could be a sign of a severe infection. And so the reason why we want to you know, talk to your physician about this one is because if you're on one of these medications and you still have like a fever and white blood cell count, then that's a sign that you might have a severe infection. So that's why you know, we want you to contact your doctor when it comes to um, to any of those. Um, one thing to definitely be aware about is for methotrexate, the way that it works is um, it prevents some of your rapid growing cells um, from, from growing based off of um, the breaking down of folic acid. And so the reason being for the contraindication for for pregnancy is because you know when you're when you're pregnant those are some of the most or the most fastest uh, replicating cells and so that's why that would be a contraindication with that. Um, so if you're pregnant, please don't take this medication. Um, it can cause the toxicity, uh, myelosuppression, which is once again like your expression of your white blood cells, um, renal failure, GI toxicity, or any any skin reactions as well. I'm going to move forward to the other leflunomide immunosuppressant. 
Um, some of the side effects with that one it may include alopecia, weight loss, um, some increase in liver enzymes, diarrhea, headache, uh, respiratory inf infection, or, or nausea. And some of the contraindications is hepatotoxicity, um, bone marrow suppression as well. Um, and then likewise with uh, alitamide, it's also immunosuppressant. Some of the side effects, you know, may include drowsiness, hypotension, which is like a drop in blood pressure, decreased platelets or white blood cell counts, um, and bradycardia. Um, once again, a contraindication with this one is definitely fetal harm. So if you are pregnant, we do not want you to be um, taking this medication. And let's see. Okay. Let's see. Oh, and the reason why, you know, the reason why some of these immunosuppressant drugs are prescribed is to kind of promote a rapid tapering of the glucocorticosteroids. So we really don't want you on steroids for a long period of time because those also have their own set of side effects. So the reason why, you know, these immunosuppressant drugs are prescribed is so that we can kind of get you off of um, the glucocorticoids and other steroids that can cause a little bit even greater um, um, harm when taken for a longer period of time. Okay, you can go to the next one, boss. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben, for that setup. Uh, just as Ben was saying, you know, mild to moderate uh, lupus. Now we're going to go transition into moderate to severe lupus. So with moderate to severe lupus, we usually do a combination of several drugs um, used together. So these can include steroids, azathioprine, belimumab, benlista, uh, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, mycophenolate, rituximab, tacolimus, or cyclosporin. So because moderate to severe disease has organ involvement, these stronger immunosuppressive drugs that we're going to talk about uh, may be used, and it may, you may be just prescribed several of them in combination. The side effect profiles of these stronger agents can be a little bit more bothersome for most patients uh, for their side effects, uh, but usually the benefit of the treatment and the slowing down of lupus symptoms outweighs the potential uh, side effects of these agents. And therapies like lilimab, which we will talk about in a future slide in much more detail, are especially beneficial in patients who have lupus that is specifically targeting their kidneys. Uh, this is to help maintain and preserve uh, kidney function over time. And we'll be discussing more of that in further details in further slides. Uh, but for now, we'll talk about azathioprine. So azathioprine is another is a immunosuppressive drug that is used for moderate to severe lupus. The most common side effects are going to be nausea and vomiting, and these are usually mild for most patients. Some patients can develop potentially swollen joints, fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, as well as muscle pain. Some rare and more serious side effects of azathioprine can include pancreatitis, an increased risk of cancer, which is possible with this agent, decreased white blood cell production, also known as myelosuppression, anemia, liver and cardiac toxicity, an increased risk of infection, like Ben was talking about. Make sure your, uh, your doctor is monitoring your white blood cell count, um, which includes fever, you know, any kind of sore throat, et cetera, as well as potential hypersensitivity or slash allergic reactions. Some contraindications to starting therapy um, with azathioprine are treatment in pregnant women. Uh, this drug can potentially uh, cause uh, damage to a, uh, a growing baby. So we want to make sure that we avoid this one in pregnant women. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis are also on this drug, but patients with rheumatoid arthritis that have previously been treated with an alkylating agent, such as um, Femuxostat, or uh, with alkylating agents such as you know, cyclosporin or another uh, potential cancer drug, we want to avoid this medication. It may cause too much immunosuppression in that case. Use of azathioprine with a drug called febuxostat that's going to be used for gout it has a potential drug interaction. So if you do have gout and are on azathioprine uh, being treated with febuxostat, you want to make sure that you double check that drug interaction uh, with your doctor before you start taking it. Some major black box warnings for this drug include chronic immunosuppression with azathioprine, an increased risk of uh, cancer, uh, particular cancers of the skin. So it can potentially cause uh, some skin cancers more specifically. Uh, lymphoma, so cancers of your blood, as well as uh, leukemias. In addition to that, belimumab we will cover in a future slide in much more detail since it's a more newer agent, so we're very excited about uh, talking about that drug. Uh, but going on to cyclophosphamide. So cyclophosphamide uh, can be used for several different conditions because it is a very potent immunosuppressive. Uh, main side effects are going to be alopecia, so hair loss. You can develop some skin pigmentation, uh, some rashes. Uh, you may notice a change in the color of the growth of your fingers, fingernails um, as well. So it's a very unique side effect that you want to be watchful for. 
Some patients may develop uh, stomatitis, which is a sores on, on the mouth or tongue, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Patients tend to get a decreased appetite with uh, cyclophosphamide, as well as potentially uh, decreased white blood cells, which increases your risk for infection. Uh, very important for uh, female patients that have cyclophosphamide is that it can cause amenorrhea, which is the absence, so the lack of your monthly menstrual period. So definitely something to you know let your uh, female patients know about um, that it may cause a lack of your, your it may cause a lack of your cycle, your normal cycle. Some serious side effects with this medication include cardiotoxicity, so it can potentially damage the tissues of your heart. Uh, congestive heart failure can potentially be a possible. Cardiac arrhythmias, so irregular heartbeats can occur. Skin tumors can potentially develop. You can potentially get that uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, which is a very, very rare, but very, very painful um, uh, side effect. Uh, this is basically like your skin starts to basically kind of peel off and you may get little uh, pustules. So very, very rare if you do notice any kind of painful skin reaction, you definitely wanna discontinue that drug as soon as possible, go to the emergency room, that is a medical emergency. So if you do notice any kind of blistering or peeling skin that is painful, let your doctor know as soon as possible, go to the ER. Uh, the drug can potentially also cause uh, some leukemias, liver cancer, uh, some patients do develop anaphylaxis or a, a severe allergic reaction with this medication. If specific to your kidneys, it can potentially cause bladder cancer, as well as fibrosis of the uh, bladder. You can also develop uh, a very uh, unique side effect, which is called hemorrhagic cystitis. This is basically when blood actually gets into your urine. So you'll notice it as basically like red urine that's coming out. Uh, this is a very rare but unique side effect, and there are drugs to mitigate that um, side effect as well. So definitely let your doctor know if you do notice any kind of uh, uh, red urine uh, as soon as possible so that he can potentially start treating that. You can also develop potential kidney cancer and particularly for your lungs, you may get up some uh, fibrosis or some scarring of your lung tissue, making it a little more difficult to breathe as well as some potential pneumonia. For male patients that are taking cyclophosphamide, it's very important to know, oh, sorry, can we go back to the last slide? Yeah. Um, very important to know that cyclophosphamide can potentially cause a low sperm count or a lack of sperm during orgasm. So for male patients, very, very important to know um, in case that you are potentially planning to get pregnant while on the medication, but definitely a very strong conversation to have with your provider. And some additional toxicities and warnings for cyclophosphamide include skin, cancer, renal, reproductive issues, immune system, liver, endocrine and metabolic, cardiotoxicity and lungs. I know that was a very long list of potential side effects for this agent, but it is a very strong immunosuppressive and typically is used for uh, more mo moderate to severe. Uh, you can go ahead, Tom. All right. Um, so keeping the conversation going. Um, and once again, um, when we are sharing these side effects there, you know, they, they are just like potential risks, you know, that's all. And um, when when trying to evaluate which medication that you should take, um, once again, it's it's also important to be transparent with your with your physician, you know, to talk about how you're feeling. And so we can kind of um, triangulate that once again and uh, be transparent with your physician about that. So uh, one of the next medication I'm going to talk about is called mycophenolate. So um, this actually is... What it does, it kind of helps to uh, work on the immune system, and more specifically, it works directly on T and B lymphocytes. So those are the main, um, some of the main drivers of um, your immune response and um, causing inflammation. Um, and so what mycophenolate does, it, it works on their proliferation. So it kind of stops how fast they're making and uh, producing themselves. Um, so therefore, it suppresses a, a, the cell mediated response and antibody formation because once again with lupus your body's building antibodies um or an immune response like uh they're going to war against themselves so this drug kind of helps to kind of work in between there kind of stop um them from building up their army of you know of cells that are that is attacking yourself if that makes sense um and so some serious side effects with that um does include like increased risk of infections because they're working on the immune system um, and my lower your white blood cell count or red blood cell counts. So that, that can also lead to like increased risk of infection and anemia. 
Um, it can cause a little bit of renal impairment um, and also GI perforation. So basically like a, a tear in the intestinal wall can also be a potential risk. And that will be a medical emergency, um, especially if there's any bleeding involved. And you would see that like if you you know have a stool or um, any poop that is like specifically really dark, um, that would be um, a sign of like a really black and dark. Um, that would be a sign that you may have um, some bleeding uh, going on in like as well as a company with like severe stomach pain or like stomach pain that doesn't go away. Um, as far as reproductive risk, um, it has been shown to cause harm to a fetus. So if you are pregnant, uh, we would, at, you know, it definitely should avoid pregnancy during treatment. And for six, uh, and for six weeks after the last dose of the medication, uh, we would like you to um, still continue to take birth control methods and men should not donate sperm um, during this period of time while you're taking that medication. Um, let's see, there's also um, an increased risk of a skin cancer or another form of cancer. Um, there's also an increased risk of uh, <clears throat> uh, a condition called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So this can be a risk when taking this medication is due to the immune weakened the weakened immune system. But if you experience weakness on like one side of the body or you develop apathy, like not caring about things that you usually care about or you can't control your muscles or you're confused, you're having problems thinking. Now, while on this medication, we definitely would like you to uh, contact your doctor on that one. Definitely do that. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is rituximab. So um, in terms of the side effects, it is, you know, a little bit milder on that. Um, a headache, fever, night sweats could be a potential side effect, um, vomiting, low mood, constipation, or, or a cough. Um, and some of the warnings that we want to they want to talk or shed light on is so infusion reactions. This is um, an infusion drug. So uh, you when they are, you know, in, inserting the needle, you might have uh, a, a skin rash at the place that they put the needle in for the infusion to take place. Um, also, tumor lysis syndrome. I also touched on that earlier. Um, potentially, uh, renal toxicity or bowel obstruction and perforation. Um, and also with live vaccines, we would like you to avoid those. So like your shingles, vaccines, um, your zoster, we want you to uh, kind of avoid those whenever you're on those specific medications. All right. Um, next, we're going to talk about uh, trichrolimus. Um, and so that one, some of the side effects may include like uh, infection, uh, increased blood sugar, urine volume changes, and also posterior encephalopathy syndrome. Um, and then some of the things that we want to be or want to want you to be aware of is like it increases your susceptibility to infection once again because it is immunosuppressant. Um, and so development of some lymphoma, uh, lymphomas can occur from the immunosuppression. And this likewise with um, cyclosporin. Um, so it may include high blood pressure, um, increased hair growth swollen gums, numbness, tremors, and a little bit of restlessness as well. Um, and then it could also has the potential to cause like some liver and kidney problems as well as an infection. And then for methotrexate, um, some of the side effects does include like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, mouth ulcers, alopecia, um, photosensitivity, so sensitivity to the sun and light, rashes, decreased levels of immune cells, and, and joint or muscle pain is also common as well. Now, the main thing I want to talk about this one as far as warnings is do not um, take, I mean, do not become pregnant. So like um, it's definitely contraindicated if you're pregnant. Um, it's not safe for babies. So please take birth control. Um, some counseling points for that one is like, don't become pregnant until like, at least one menstrual cycle after the treatment is resolved. Um, or no, don't try to get pregnant until like three months after the treatment is finished. Um, as far as guys, you know, no trying for a baby until about three months after the treatment with methotrexate is complete. Uh, let's see. I think that is all I had um, with that one. Okay, we can go on to the next slide, boss. All right. So now we're going to go over the steroids because we have talked about steroids being the main one of the mainstays of therapy. We want to go over in more specific detail to kind of show you exactly why we use this medication at the beginning and then over time take you off of it. 
Uh, so steroids are another mainstay of therapy for lupus because they have very potent immunosuppressive effects. Although these drugs work very well and they also work very fast for treating the symptoms of lupus, they do have both short-term and long-term side effects. Because taking longer doses of these drugs for a longer duration of time uh, can have negative effects on several organs in your body, you want to limit the use of these drugs uh, in the long term. Uh, so especially in moderate to severe lupus, we typically taper patients off over time of the steroids, and then we start adding more powerful drugs such as methotrexate or mycophenolate to keep that same level of immunosuppression uh, for your body. So some short-term side effects, and these medications include prednisone, corticosone, hydrocortisone, prednisolone, methylprednisolone, triamcinolone, dexamethasone, and betamethasone. The most common one that most patients take is prednisone. It's a very tiny oral tablet. Um, so that's probably going to be the most uh, u- uh, usual one that most patients will be prescribed. The short-term side effects of prednisone uh, include increased blood sugars. So this is especially important for patients who also have diabetes to monitor their blood sugar regularly and report any problems with their glycemic control while taking this class of drugs. Another important side effect is increased blood pressure. So patients with hypertension may notice that they have uh, less hypertensive control. Increased intraocular pressure can occur in your eye, and this can potentially lead to glaucoma. So patients with who develop any division changes, it's very important to uh, maybe get an eye exam or go see an optometrist to really get that evaluated. In addition to that, there may be, uh, because it is a steroid and it's amping up um, different parts of your body, different signaling pathways, it can potentially cause some mood changes. And this can include emotional instability, euphoria, mood swings, as well as potential irritability, another very uh, common uh, thing with these drugs. So because these drugs can potentially develop insomnia, and insomnia is very noticeable short term, we typically tell patients to take these drugs first thing in the morning to avoid uh, disturbing your sleep in the evening. The drugs can potentially cause fluid retention and edema, and this can occur in your legs, in your ankles, or in your feet. And this is basically a water buildup or a fluid buildup um, uh, within like the tissues that are around those areas. It can also cause fluid buildup in your lungs or your heart. So uh, it should be used cautiously in patients who have pre-existing heart failure. It can also cause an increased appetite as well as weight gain. So it's very important to be monitoring your weight while on glucocorticoids. And another very important uh, common or short-term side effect is gonna be skin changes. So some patients actually experience a skin thinning. They may develop some more acne. They may, it may also cause hair growth in more non-characteristic ways outside of the top of your head. So it's called hirsutism. This may develop in women. They may start growing out a mustache a little bit more. Um, so that is a, a uh, common side effect of the steroids. Uh, you may also develop hair thinning, so the actual opposite. So your hair follicles actually thin out. Some patients also develop a face redness as well as a striae-like marks or stripe-like marks, kind of like a zebra on your skin. And this is a normal side effect with these drugs. And very importantly with these drugs, it may cause important um, impaired wound healing. So if you already have a pre-existing uh, cut, it may take a little bit longer to heal. So very important if you do have any major or large cuts that you do let your doctor know so that you know they can potentially add any antibiotic or other regimens to that. Uh, it can potentially cause uh, coldness, weakness, ironness, nausea and vomiting. Uh, weight loss can also occur in the short term uh, with this class of drugs. So it can be either weight loss or weight gain uh, in the short term for these drugs. Now let's go over some of the long-term side effects of these drugs. Um, and these are the ones that we uh, are potential reasons why we want to stop these drugs over time. Uh, patients can develop osteoporosis, and this is a major concern, especially in older patients. Uh, we recommend avoiding alcohol and smoking to decrease the risk of developing osteoporosis with these drugs in the long term. You can develop something that's called a moon face. So this is a, a round, puffy appearance to your face. And these are due to fat deposits on the sides of your face, uh, basically kind of building up. So it may, you may look a little bit more rounder in your face in the long term. Again, but we don't want to use it uh, for too long and take you off of it. Some patients can develop edema. So again, caution in heart failure, increased risk of glaucoma and cataracts. So again, it may affect your eyes and your vision. It can potentially cause weight gain in the long term. So if you use it too long, that weight gain and those gain in pounds can be contributed to the steroids. It may also cause psychiatric and mood disorders. And it's going to include confusion, uh, psychosis, as well as depression. 
And in pediatric patients, in the long term, this can potentially uh, cause hyperglycemia, low calcium, low uh, potassium, as well as decreased body growth. So in pediatric patients, especially who develop lupus, we definitely want to use steroids to treat the immediate symptoms and then take them off because we can potentially stunt their growth over time. Some important drug interactions with the steroids. Um, the steroids can interact with cyclosporin, which as you've uh, known is another treatment for lupus. They may increase the cyclosporin toxicity and uh, symptoms related to the steroids. So it may cause more hypertension, more edema, electrolyte imbalances, as well as uh, increased blood sugar. Uh, steroids can potentially interact with warfarin, a very important drug that we want to be very careful with. They can increase your risk of bleeding and diminish the effects of warfarin, so make warfarin less effective. So we definitely want to make sure in patients who uh, are on warfarin that we monitor their INR very closely for longer exposure of steroids. They can also interact with the NSAIDs. These are your aspirin, your naproxen, your tocopins. Uh, these can potentially cause together increased risk of hypertension, some GI ulcers, as well as potential GI bleeding. So definitely things to watch out for if you are also on an NSAID. The diuretics, such as your furosemide, also called the water pill uh, to most patients, it can potentially cause some electrolyte imbalances, especially with your potassium. So definitely something very important to know if you are on those drugs. The diabetes medications, these include your metformin and other anti-diabetic drugs. The glucocorticoids, the steroids, can cause hyperglycemia, so increase your blood sugars over time. And so that also counteracts the effects of the anti-diabetic medications. Anti-seizure drugs, such as phenytoin, uh, anti-seizure drugs may uh, lower the steroid effectiveness. So if you are on any kind of uh, drugs for seizures, they may actually lower the steroid effectiveness. So we may potentially use it for a longer term for you, but that's something to discuss with your doctor. Bupropion is another very important agent. Uh, steroids can also contribute to the lowering of the seizure threshold. So the lowering of the seizure threshold makes it easier to have seizures. So it'll increase your risk of seizures if you take the prednisone as well as the potential bupropion. Macrolide antibiotics, such as clarithromycin, uh, these antibiotics may increase the steroid levels in your body. And this will lead to increased steroid side effects, such as the short-term side effects that are on the slide. Fluoroquinolone antibiotics, you may develop an increased risk of tendon rupture uh, when taken with the steroids. In addition, estrogens, so these include those estrogens in your birth control um, or hormonal contraceptives. These may cause decreased hormonal contraceptive levels. So definitely important to contact your doctor if you are taking steroids for a long duration while you are on birth control. You may also have to add a second form of birth control um, or effective contraceptive, or contraceptive, but that's going to be based on what your doctor instructs you to do. And also, uh, certain, uh, certain drugs such as nifedipine, glucocorticoids can result in decreased nifedipine levels, which would also potentially uh, decrease your blood pressure lowering effects as well. Can go to the next slide. All right. So, you know, now that we've gotten some of the, you know, mainstay treatments out of the way, now we're going to talk about some of the ones who are recent, recently FDA approved. Um, and these are agents that have been approved for a specific indication. Uh, however, they're also doing more studies expanding the um, the population that they're testing in, whether it be like pediatrics for them. Um, and they're also, you know, working on how they can work in combination with other agents as well um, to have better effects. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Safnello. I was approved in 2021 for the treatment of adults with moderate to severe systemic lupus uh, erythematosum uh, erythematosus. Um, and it is also indicated for those who are already receiving standard therapy. So if you've already tried um, glucocorticosteroids or are on another uh, regimen such as like uh, hydroxychloroquine, then this is something that all right, after you've taken a couple, now they're like, all right, now let's transition into to this. Um, it has not been approved for patients with lupus nephritis, um, but it is being studied. And the way that you would receive this medication, it is an infusion. Over, <laughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Is an uh, it's a thirty minute infusion every four weeks. So you would take this IV, you would go uh, to an infusion center, and you, know, you would be in there for about thirty minutes every four weeks. Um, the next one I want to talk to you about is um vocalosporin lupinus. This is approved in two thousand twenty one. Uh, it's for the treatment of adult patients with active lupus nephritis in combo with another immunosuppressive therapy. So if you're already taking another agent, um, such as you know low dose steroids, 
Um, this is something that um, patients would um, patients could also take as well. Um, and it's an oral capsule. It's going to be taken uh, once to twice a day. I'm sorry. So 7.9 milligram capsule is going to be taken twice a day. Um, and once again, you're going to be use it with like another medication like mycophenolate or, or corticosteroids. Um, with this medication, if you do not see clinical benefit in um, six weeks, not six weeks, in 24 weeks, I'm sorry, 24 weeks, um, at that point, then the doctor would, would switch it to something else. Um, and also, if you do have some renal uh, problems or renal issues, they're going to adjust the dose based off of that. Um, there are also other contraindications if you're taking like strong um, CYP 3A4 inhibitors. Um, definitely, you know, if you're on this medication, do not drink grape juice for sure. Um, let's see. And then lastly, there's a medication called Benlista. Um, and this medication is given once every two weeks for the first three infusions. And then after that is going to be given every four weeks. Um, and this medication is given sub Q um, for... Let's see. After that, then it's oh, so it, for the subkey version, it's given two injections once a week for four doses, and then it's going to be one injection uh, once a week thereafter. Let's see. So for All right. oh yeah, you go on to the next. Yep. Oh yeah, I got it. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go a little bit deeper into belimumab and Lista. Uh, thank you, Ben, for that uh, great introduction for it. So belimumab and Lista was approved originally in 2011 for the treatment of lupus but it recently got approved for the treatment of lupus nephritis. So the kidney involvement specific of lupus back in 2020, wonderful year. Uh, this is a very important monoclonal antibody agent that is used to treat active SLE as well as lupus nephritis. Um, so we will be covering this uh, in a little bit more detail right now. During the clinical trials for this drug, 61% of patients had reduced disease activity and 60% of patients had improvement in their skin, their joints, and most importantly, their kidney function uh, versus the standard of care treatments. So these were really, really great results and a very exciting development in the treatment of lupus. And uh, like Ben said, this can be done intravenously or sub-Q. Some contraindications for this drug are previous anaphylaxis or history of allergies uh, with any ingredient to Benlista. Some very important considerations if your doctor is thinking of starting this drug are avoiding pregnancy during and four weeks after stopping the drug, just to make sure that there's no uh, potential residual uh, drug in the system. Some warnings for Benlista are going to be IV reactions can potentially occur that your doctor will potentially help monitor. Uh, increased risk of infection uh, because it does decrease your immune system and it is still an immunosuppressive drug. Increased risk of cancer is also potentially possible. Increased risk of psychiatric events uh, can also occur. And increased risk of PMO, which is again, like Ben said, uh, more of a rare uh, potential condition, but definitely something that your doctor should talk to you about in regards to more serious side effects. Uh, some common side effects of this drug are nausea and vomiting. Some patients develop infusion reactions, especially if you're giving it IV. Uh, some patients potentially develop nasopharyngitis, which is kind of like an inflammation of your uh, nasal system. Some patients develop fever, infectious disease, which is very common because it is decreasing your immune system with this drug. Some patients also develop a little bit of insomnia, so a little bit of difficulty sleeping with this newer agent. Some patients develop leg or arm pain, as well as potential headaches, including migraines uh, with this drug. And because it is potentially given IV or sub Q, you may get some local injection site reactions. This includes pain at the injection site, uh, some redness, some itching, or potential swelling. Some serious side effects of Benlista include obviously cancer, some hypersensitivity, aka allergic reactions uh, to the infusion, serious infections, um, as well as disease or infusion reactions. Uh, PML, that's the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy that Ben was talking about on the last slide. Some patients can and have potentially developed depression with this drug or mental disorders, as well as potential suicidal behavior while on this drug. So very important if you already have uh, pre-existing uh, depression. And some patients do develop some lung activity, uh, and this can include potential uh, bronchitis. All right, moving forward. Thank you so much, Osa.
Uh, moving forward, we're going to talk about Safnello. So as I mentioned before, this was recently approved in the year 2021 for adults with SLE. Um, some of the contraindications with this one, like I said before, if you have any strong CYP3A4 inhibitors um, that you are taking along with this medication, um, that is something that you want to offer. And definitely grapefruit juice is well. once again if you are on if you are taking these medications do not take grapefruit juice because it does have some of the same um interactions with the medication that um the the cyp 3 4 inhibitors can also have as well and some of those you know some of those cyp inhibitors you may see um may include like antidepressants as well so just make sure that um your medication isn't interacting with that which is also something that um you can discuss with your physician as well too um, let's see some of the other contraindications is with cyclophosphamide just because it's not yet studied. Um, so once again, a lot of times with treatment decisions, the doctor is trying to figure out what is the best um, way to go, the what the best route to go for you as a patient. Um, some additional considerations is um, faster time to complete renal response one year after starting therapy um, compared to the standard of care. Um, it also has reduced protein in the urine. Um, faster than mycophenolate uh, plus uh, some corticosteroids um, being prescribed alone. And some warnings, too, I want to touch on is increased risk of infection, uh, nephrotoxicity, hyperkalemia, which is like increased um, potassium in the blood, uh, QT prolongation. So if you experience any abnormal heartbeats, we definitely want you to contact your doctor about that one. Um, please avoid any live vaccinations. It does pose a fetal risk. Um, risk of lymphoma, lymphoma, skin cancer, or um, pure red cell aplasia. Um, some of the side effects that I want to touch on briefly are hypertension, so increased blood pressure. Um, and also, if you're, it, it could also require a renal adjustment dose, uh, or do, a, a, dose, a dose adjustment, if you also are taking this medication with um, a blood pressure medicine, known as a calcium channel blocker. So you might notice it's like amlodipine or Norvas. Um, if you're taking those medications, then we want to, you know, switch you to something else. If also some of the side effects may be diarrhea, headache, other neurological side effects, um, anemia, um, cough, potential UTI, urinary tract infection, uh, abdominal pain, alopecia, dyspepsia, mouth ulcers, fatigue, um, any tremors, or decreased appetite. And once again, um, as far as the side effects, these are things that happen like within the clinical trials that they just had to take note of um, so that you are aware of them. It doesn't happen to everybody. Um, in fact, a lot of these um, potentially, as far as percentages, may not be as high, but they just wanted to make sure that you are more aware of these. Um, okay, we go to the next slide. Also. Oh, and lastly, oh, lastly, right. sorry, lastly on that one, um, Real data now uh, for at least the, I mean, Safnello also showed that it had greater remission versus standard therapy alone after for years. So I know that I talked to earlier that remission sometimes is hard to achieve, but these patients, after being on this medication for about four years, um, achieved complete remission. And so like they, they achieved remission and they, you know, withstood that remission for a good four years. So that's another thing to kind of um, harp on or that I would like to harp on with these medications that are coming out. So they're using what's called real world data and real world evidence. So they're tracking these medications. So a lot of times in clinical trials, you know, they achieved a certain endpoint, but now that um, the study is already approved, now they're able to use different data points to kind of track these patients and track the different side effects they may have, to, all to kind of make these medications better, to show what are some new targets that we may be able to um, work on or um, in order to create a better response for patients, uh, a lesser side effect profile, um, and create, honestly, better treatment outcomes for the patient. So I just want to share that out as well. Oh, and they're also starting a trial in pediatrics. Um, they just opened it up, I believe, um, in November. So they they just close. They just opened. I think they closed enrollment, but they're starting the actual trial now, um, in pediatrics uh, as of this month. So it's another good thing. But yeah, you can go to the next slide now. Awesome. Thank you for that uh, additional info. All right. So now we're going to talk about Lucinus. This is Baclosporin. That is the generic name. 
uh, as you can uh, kind of see, baclosporin, cyclosporin, these drugs are actually in a very similar class. They're called calcimurin inhibitors. So the drug is structurally similar to cyclosporin, but a little bit different. It also does have immunosuppressive and anti-inflammatory effects. And very important with this drug, since it was approved in 2021, we do want to talk about some of the results. Uh, some of the hallmark results in the clinical trial for this agent was a faster time to complete renal response one year after starting therapy. And this was compared to the standard of care, which was mycophenolate and low-dose steroids. Um, in addition to that, patients who were in the clinical trials also had reduced proteinuria. Uh, this is basically uh, your kidneys leaking out uh, protein, which is a, a little bit of a marker for uh, kidney damage. So patients had less kidney damage faster um, than the mycophenolate and corticosteroid group alone. So another uh, really hallmark newer agent that we are very excited about and are continuing to see more data. Uh, very important with this drug, there are some uh, increased warnings of increased risk of infections. These can include bacterial, fungal, viral, and opportunistic. The drug can potentially cause some acute nephrotoxicity, um, some uh, acute renal impairment. The drug can also cause potential neurotoxicity, so it can uh, cause potential seizures, delirium, headaches, mental status changes, et cetera. Hyperkalemia, which is increased potassium levels in your blood. So certain diuretics, such as the you know, loop diuretics and et cetera, as well as some blood pressure lowering agents like ACE inhibitors, so your lisinopril, et cetera, uh, may also increase the risk of hyperkalemia. The drug can potentially cause some uh, QT prolongation. These are irregular heartbeats. So your doctor may monitor certain electrolytes and run an ECG based on those results. It is very important with this drug to avoid live vaccines while on the therapy. Uh, this can include your NMR, your polio, uh, you know, your intranasal flu vaccines and more. As well as this, this drug can potentially uh, be dangerous in pregnancy. So it can have some fetal risk. So avoid this drug in pregnancy as well as potential breastfeeding. Uh, some specific warnings for this drug, it can potentially cause pure red blood cell aphasia. This was also for the previous drug as well. Um, this is basically a very rare condition that usually affects adults. It's characterized by the absence of uh, red cell, red blood cell precursors uh, called reticulocytes in your bone marrow and a very low red blood cell count. So the amount of white blood cell counts as well as your platelets remain normal, but your red blood cells for whatever reason by themselves are going down. Um, so patients with pure red blood uh, your red blood cell aphasia uh, may feel a signs of anemia, and these can include fatigue, uh, pale skin, dizziness, as well as shortness of breath. Uh, some other important uh, warnings are the drug can potentially cause lymphoma, so cancers of the uh, lymph nodes um, and cells of the immune system, as well as potential skin cancer. So very important with this drug, you want to make sure that you're monitoring for any skin changes, avoiding UV light, uh, wearing protective clothing as well as using a sunscreen with an SPF of 30 or higher. Some contraindications with this agent include um, use of strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. These are one of the enzymes that help to process medications and substances in your liver. Uh, these can include drugs like ketoconazole, etraconazole, so your antifungals, uh, as well as potential clethromycin. Severe allergic reactions uh, to leukinous orange ingredients are also another contraindication. So if you do start this drug and have any severe allergic reactions, uh, your doctor may take you off of it. Um, and the significant efficacy of cyclophosphamide and leukinous hasn't been well studied. Um, so avoiding cyclosporin with leukinous uh, is a appropriate decision uh, for this specific drug. Uh, some common side effects of this drug include hypertension, um, this is very similar to the cyclosporin. It can raise your blood pressure. Uh, you definitely want to be watchful for any kind of diarrhea, headache, as well as neurological symptoms, um, any anemia, so that low red blood cell count that I was talking about earlier. Cough is a common side effect with this drug. Uh, it's very, very important for women. Uh, UTIs can be increased with this drug as well. Abdominal pain. You may develop some potential hair loss, so alopecia. You may develop some uh, mouth ulcers or dyspepsia, as well as potential uh, fatigue, so feeling tired. Some patients develop tremors while on this medication, and some patients had a decreased appetite, so very important to kind of monitor your weight. You can go to the next slide. All right, all right. So 
before we um ended the um the patient education um portion of it, I would, we did want to talk about some of the therapies that essentially you know, maybe coming to the pharmacy soon, hopefully, um, they are being studied currently. So all of these listed are in phase three. Um, the tough reality is that lupus is a very difficult disease to treat. You know, we, we touched on like there's like a plethora of different ways that um, the body can often attack itself and present itself as lupus. Um, and the what comes with that is that there's so many different signals. There's so many different pathways that inflammation can spark. And so as a result of that, Sometimes, you know, a lot of pharma companies, they may have a drug that targets a specific way, a specific pathway, but yet it doesn't see the efficacy in the long term. Um, but what I will say is that um, immunology immunology is a very, a very hot topic, a very hot space and very um, intriguing for a lot of pharma companies to to help patients with these um, different disease states. And more specifically for lupus, uh, we do have a few that, that are in phase three. So um, these are the companies that um, are currently have some products right now that are in that last stage. So Biogen has a couple. Uh, we have Hoffman LaRoche that has, has a uh, agent that's in phase three, Emu Pharma, Novartis, BMS, Reamgen, Biosciences. So we touched on earlier about how if you do feel as though you would like to participate in a clinical trial, um, you could contact your doctor and kind of work through what that would look like. Um, but I did want to touch on those agents. And there's currently um, quite a bit of other pharma companies with drugs that are in the phase two. Um, so we have AbbVie with a few. We have Senefi with a few. Um, and also Amgen has an agent as well. So um just want to touch on that. And so um, we also work in, uh, work in a space where, you know, we're also increasing diversity in recruitment as well. So the more patients that are uh, willing to participate in clinical trials, we can get better data and we can also um, have more targeted therapies and understand this disease state more efficiently and as best as we possibly can. So um, thank you all for listening. And yeah, we can go to the next slide, boss. Before we go to the next slide, there was a uh, there was a question from one of the uh, one of the participants. Um, I'd like to to read it to you and get your take on it. Uh, they want to know: Is there a medicine that replaces Plaquenil that that works as well? Uh, they've taken Plaquenil for forty seven years and have been in remission. Mm. Yeah, that's a very very great question. Right now, there's not a kind of mainstay part of treatment that has replaced Plaquenil. Um, Aquino has been used for a very, very long time. It's been out for, I mean, decades. Um, but right now, Paquino and its, its place in the therapy is kind of as a kind of a bedrock or a foundational. Um, patients can potentially stop taking Paquino and just be using other drugs. But typically, most providers will keep them on Paquino um, just because of its kind of side effect profile, limited side effects compared to the other more moderate to severe agents. Uh, but currently, right now, it is possible that some of these newer drugs can be developed, may replace it, um, like the ones that are on this slide. Uh, but currently, right now, with its place in therapy, it's kind of a little bit of a foundational one uh, as of right now. But who knows? In, in the future, there may be other potential agents that could uh, take over that. But it will require a lot of time to do those studies and to you know try them out in clinical practice. Great question. For sure. For sure. And, and just to pick you what back off of that, thank you. Um, also, in terms of like a drug being better than Paquinil, it also would require the the pharma companies to actually set up a trial where they, you know, some may go head to head with Paquinil with their agent. And a lot, oftentimes, you know, pharma companies may not want to take that route because it's not as uh, it's a little bit harder to um, get approval or it's not some people don't seem like it's necessary at that stage. Right. right. So like you may like like Osa pointed to alluded to um, once it's approved, then they might start to do post. Uh, marketing studies and compare it to other agents and compare efficacies to see which one's better. But um, initially, they might just run a trial to see if it actually does work versus placebo just to get it approved. And then that's when they start to do deeper studies to see, okay, what is how does this agent work against this agent? And honestly, that's what the insurance companies want to see in order in order to pay a um to pay for a new agent because just because. Um, pharma companies may get it FDA approved, the insurance now has to cover that agent or else the cost burden gets put on the patient as you guys. So um, as far as covering these agents, 
when they do get approval and they start to compare and have more efficacy data in the real world, that's when you'll start to see more evidence in terms of head to head trials and we'll be able to just, you know, give a little more information about, you know, which one's better. Great question. All right. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Yep, go ahead. These, these are great. <laughs> all right. So we had a uh, few uh, starter questions just to get the ball rolling. Uh, looks like these were potentially uh, pulled or grabbed. Uh, so question, the first question is, are there ways to confirm and diagnose this? Um, ben, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I can take it. Um, so lupus can be challenging um, because it, once again, it presents with such a wide different range of symptoms that can mim mimic other conditions. So you, you, you have joint pain, you know, your physician might think it's just arthritis versus being a part of a bigger picture. So as me and I also talked though earlier, um, it's important to keep your patient journey and keep your own personal journal as well so that, you know, patients can uh, understand, you can understand not only, you know, the, some of the symptoms that you've been receiving, but um, also kind of get a, a treatment plan after diagnosis that kind of more aligns with where you are. Um, there are like quite a few bit of tests that they use to diagnose lupus. And so they have like a anti-nuclear antibody test. So that's when they test the 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 inner workings of the the nuclear um so in a nutshell basically once some of your cells um they may die or they might they may pop as a result of inflammation response and your body builds up an immune response to those specific cells so if you have any antibodies that are specific to you know your own um your only your own body cells and your own um body dna um then that's when um the test will be positive. They also have a complete blood count that they take. Um, they have your your red blood cell counts, your C-reactive proteins that shows any inflammation. They have elevated um, antibodies in your, in your the, the elevated antibody tests. They also have you know skin biopsies, uh, imaging studies, X-rays. They also take antiphospholipid antibody tests. Um, so that so basically, if you have high levels of that, or if you have your high levels of antibody tests, then that could um, be uh, a sign that you might be more susceptible to blood clotting. So um, essentially you have to go to different specialists to get different opinions. And I think that's the, one of the most challenging things we've heard from patients as well is that, you know, they may go to their primary care physician and, you know, the doctor may say, oh, well, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Or I don't, you know, I don't know if this, you know, warrants a whole diagnosis uh, of lupus. And so, it sometimes it takes patients four to five years to get a diagnosis. And sometimes, once again, like I said before, it might get misdiagnosed um, as because they might think of something else. So ultimately, you have to take a lot of lab tests and you have to go to different specialists um, to see and get different opinions to see, oh, OK, make sure that this is lupus and not, you know, mistaken for another diagnosis. So hope I answered that. Yeah, great job, Ben. Uh, second question is going to be, if I'm not feeling heard by my primary care physician, what are some next steps that I can take to better advocate for myself? And I can definitely speak to this one. Uh, very important that sometimes, especially when you are going to appointments, you may want to reach out to friends and family to accompany you at your visit if you're comfortable with that. Um, this can potentially help to kind of decrease that barrier um, for the physician that sometimes the physician so focused on, you know, what's in his mind that sometimes hearing it from a family member can potentially help to be that advocate. You know, they can say something like, Hey, you know, your patients, you know, they're having this and the symptom. I'm noticing this at home. Um, is there something that we can do to help with this specific side effect or whatever is the potential barrier? In addition to that, if you're not feeling heard um, by your primary care physician, it could be something where you may want to see a specialist, especially if it's just your primary care physician. They may not be as equipped um, to handle um, more of these more severe lupus symptoms. And so it could be something where a specialist who is much more tailored to listen and knows a little bit more targeted therapies of how to tackle those things uh, could be a potential avenue for that. In addition to that, for some patients, I've had you know my own difficulties with you know insurance and certain insurance plans and locking me into uh, certain uh, providers is potentially switching insurances. I mean, a lot of employers, um, especially within the United States, have potential different options that you can select from uh, when it's time for re-enrollment. So very important if you notice that you are having issues with a specific health uh, system or a specific insurance network to see if it's potentially beneficial and you can do your research 
to switch over to a different insurance plan that can have a, a different network of doctors to also be able to talk to and potentially see about those specific problems. So it's a very great question and a very common um, potential concern for a lot of lupus patients is that they're, they feel like they're not getting enough from their primary care physician and they may need more targeted help. Uh, question number three, uh, this is going to be, how can I get involved in a clinical trial? Great question. Uh, what does it look like to participate in a clinical trial? Ben, would you like to take this one? Yes, I can. All right. So, okay. So first, um, you would like, you start with speaking with your primary care physician and then you could also speak with your rheumatologist. So rheumatologist is usually uh, specialized with inflammatory conditions. Um, and so you could definitely, you know, start off speaking to them first and they can provide any information that they may have on the ongoing trials. And then what you could also do is research some trial listings. So they have different online databases uh, with resources that list some of the ongoing trials that are going on. So some of the current reputable sources include like clinicaltrials.gov, uh, Lupus Foundations of America. Those are some some foundations that provide information on lupus um, related clinical trials. Um, also, you know, we have this um, slide deck as well. So you can also, you know, look on those different websites with those companies and see, you know, what's, what they're doing in the lupus space um, and kind of reach out to them. Also, you could visit academic medical uh, centers. So there are some major research institutions that are across you know, the nation that uh, you could definitely check into and inquire about whether or not you may be eligible to participate. So I know UCSF is a great institution, um, Stanford, you know, big, big uh, academic medical centers like those um, could be resources for you. Um, as well, as well as like, you know, I'm from North Carolina. So Duke, you know, Carolina, those are also some good institutions as well. Um, next, you can use a patient recruitment services. So there are some organizations that specialize in, you know, patient recruitment for clinical trial. And they also help to kind of break down the protocol that the trial may have going on so that it's easy, digestible for you to understand, you know, what's going on. They also have people that um, liaise, there are liaisons that kind of help to make sure that you can make an informed decision uh, when asking whether or not you would like to join in the trial. Um, lastly, there's online lupus community, uh, community. So there's online forums, support groups, and also I would check out some social media communities as well that may provide information on, on ongoing trials. Um, and then coming to some things like this. So, um, this could also provide, you know, different different avenues that you could look into. Um, but definitely the first thing is um, starting with your doctor option um, and also, you know, scheduling maybe a second opinion with uh, another specialist as well. So hopefully that answer your questions. Great coverage, Ben. Thank you. Uh, next question is going to be, what type of specialist should I receive, should I see to receive care? So because lupus targets a lot of different um, organs and uh, systems in your body, there are potentially different specialists that you may have to go to um, for overall coverage on your specific version of lupus. So there could be a rheumatologist. These are doctors who specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of autoimmune diseases, um, including lupus. Uh, they often play a very key role in managing lupus symptoms and as well as uh, coordinating care. Uh, very important for lupus because there is kidney involvement with this uh, disease is seeing a nephrologist. Um, so if lupus uh, symptoms affect your kidneys, um, also called lupus nephritis, a nephrologist is somebody that you may want to see to potentially see how much function you can get back with your uh, with certain treatments. Dermatologists. So a lot of lupus patients do develop different skin reactions, different rashes over their body. So a dermatologist is definitely somebody to see um, who can manage the skin-related uh, issues associated with lupus. Um, because lupus can potentially also affect your immune system, some patients may need to see an immunologist uh, that, specializes in, that specializes in disorders of your immune system. So since lupus is an autoimmune disease, an immunologist may be consulted, especially if there are more complex immune system issues. Cardiologists are also another very important one. Lupus can potentially affect your heart. Um, so some patients, if they already have pre-existing heart failure, pre-existing um, hypertension, they may want to see advice from a cardiologist, um, depending on the severity of their cardiotoxicity. 
Uh, lupus can potentially affect your blood as well. So a hematologist is also another great person to potentially see. Uh, they focus on blood-related disorders. Um, if lupus affects your blood cells in any kind of way, so if you're talking about anemia, clotting issues, um, a hematologist may be somebody to potentially consult. Uh, some patients may have difficulty breathing um, with their lupus, so their lupus actually affects their lungs. Um, so a pulmonologist is somebody that you can actually see for respiratory symptoms as well. Uh, endocrinologists, orthopedic specialists, uh, psychiatrists as well, especially if you're dealing with more of the emotional aspect of uh, lupus and just the overall stress of it, seeing a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a mental health professional can provide support to managing your stress, your anxiety, potential depression, or even some of the psychiatric symptoms that some of the uh, drugs can potentially cause. So there are a wide variety of different specialists to look for to receive care. It just depends on your specific version and how lupus is presenting for you. Great question. So doctors Edegun and Hinton, thank you very much for your presentation. Not only was it really interesting, it was very um, informational to us and I really appreciate that. And you mentioned your slides. We've gone through um, 25 out of 67. Uh, there's a, a ton of information. This will all be available on our website as, as well as the recording. But before we wrap up for today, are there any last questions from anyone attending? Okay, I think we answered a lot of them. Um, so I hope everyone learned something new today. I, I know I did. Uh, I do every time I, I attend one of these. Uh, and if you want to watch, re watch this session, it's going to be available on demand next week. So watch for an email. Tom, it looks like it looks like there is a potential question. Oh, good. Um, I missed it. Thank you. It looks like they may just be typing right now. They may have a, they may be drafting their statements. But you can continue, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Th thanks. It was an answer. It was an answer to a to to a question I had. Um, so, so we'll be sending out the link next week, uh, and, and please be sure to, as I mentioned in, in the, in the beginning, please be sure to, uh, take the survey, uh, that you're going to receive via email. That's going to help us find topics which are interesting to you, uh, and, and the conference and how our conferences can be, uh, can be improved. Uh, also for additional resources or questions, please visit our website at www.lfnc.org or email us at communications at lfnc.org. I hope you had a good day today. Uh, be, be sure to watch our social media, our website, our emails for more information on 2024 health conferences. And I also want to, on behalf of both doctors and the staff, wish you all a very uh, happy Thanksgiving coming up. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.